world class uh, professor program uh, with topics of development of tsunami fragility curves, impact of tsunami waves on building, uh, and is hosted by the Tsunami and Disaster Mitigation Research Center, TDMRC, University of Shah Kuala, with a collaboration with International Research Institute of Disaster Science, IRIDES, of Tohoku University, Japan. And this world-class professor program uh, promoted by the Ministry of Education and Culture of Republic of Indonesia. Before we start our uh, seminar today, we would like to hear our opening remarks from the head of TDMRC, University Syahwala, uh, Prof. Dr. Kerul Munadi. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Pa Haikal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Honorable Professor Anawat Spasri from International Research Institute of Disaster Science, IDDS of Tokyo University, uh, respected presenters and all participants of uh, this seminar. Uh, I can see some of uh, my colleagues here. Uh, ada Pak Hendra, Pak Jati juga tadi ya. Selamat pagi Pak, sampai apa kabar? Pagi, Semuanya. good morning. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> so, well, uh, first of all, let us praise Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who give us the, this chance to virtually gather in this important seminar this morning. Of course, without his blessings, it would be difficult for us to conduct this activity and to overcome any difficulties. Also, let us recite our salawat to our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, who had guided us to a more civilized period of life. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Tsunami and Disaster Mitigation Research Center of Nifstasya Kuala, I would like to reiterate our highest appreciation to IDDES of Tokyo University, who has been a very loyal and committed collaborator in research and in disaster-related activities. Our sincere grateful also goes to Professor Anawat, who has been a very supportive person since the beginning of our uh, memorandum of understanding signing between IRIDES and TDMRC. And importantly, Prof. Anawat has been our world class professor for three consecutive years since our participation in 2017. There are a number of high, there are a number of high impact publications have been co authored between. ADDES and TDMRC. And with Prof. Anawad himself, our researchers have seven joint publications so far uh, in high impact international journals, not to mention the overall number joint publication between ADDES and TDMRC. Besides this publication, we have also other number of activities such as joint conferences, trainings, and also join research. For this, it is a strong reason for us why we applaud this model of collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, since the establishment of the DRMRC in 2006, we have been promoting efforts to conduct science and technology-based disaster risk reduction. As we know, tsunami is one of important disaster-related topics in our world. Challenges to apply the research is a cohesive issue with producing research itself. Therefore, considering the importance of having one full cycle of research since its idea to its application, we have long decided to put our organization slogan as communicating science enhancing resilience. 
this mean the DMRC would see efforts to bridging research result to the need of community at risk as the utmost objective of the research itself. Therefore, today's seminars would be seen as one of our ways to disseminate what we know and what we do not know in the topic of tsunami mitigation. I was informed by the participants who registered to this conference has come to a very varied in geographical location. They are coming from either part of Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Mexico, even from Japan. Every of us in this forum has understood the global challenge of the pandemic of COVID-19 as well. Even here in Aceh, we are now still facing challenges to flatten the curve. Despite the staggering challenges, I would like to ask to everyone to keep obeying COVID-19 protocol and let us not forget to keep our high spirit to pass this turbulent period. I, there is a hope and better future for all, our, for all of us. Although this pandemic has Although this pandemic has been complicating our life, let us not forget to enhance our capacity in mitigating the impacts of the tsunami. Ladies and gentlemen, this seminar is part of our world-class professor program promoted by the Ministry of Education and Culture of Republic of Indonesia. Since it has been started in 2017, as I mentioned before, TDMRC has been very active and Alhamdulillah, we have never missed a single year to win the grant. In 2017, we received one WCP program scheme A in collaboration with our colleges from the University of Gajah Mada and University of Diponegoro. And since 2018, we, we have been granted both scheme A and scheme B every year. And only this year, Scheme A of WCP, which is the largest scheme that, con that could invite between two to, between three to eight world-class professor has not been offered by the ministry due, the, due to the COVID-19 situation. Despite this, this year, Universitas Yahkwala is the second largest number WCP granted nationally. And this would not be possible without support from the world-class professor program themselves, including Professor Anawan Spasri, who is our key speaker for today's seminar. And I would like also to congratulate uh, Dr. Samsidik and his team for uh, providing various effort in maintaining uh, this kind of uh, reputable uh, scheme of uh, WCP program. So without further ado, I would like to welcome all speakers and participants of today's seminars by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially declare that seminar on development of tsunami fragility curve is officially open. Congratulations to all participants and committee and also thank you very much uh, for all kind of support from uh, everyone. All of us hope, we hope this seminar will give a fruitful discussion and positive exchanges. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Kairun Munadi for the huh. remarkable opening speech. It is a very difficult time for us because of the pandemic COVID-19. So hopefully everyone are in the safe condition and are doing well. Before we started our discussion, I would like to uh, announce how this uh, uh, discussion is going on through our webinar today. So the first session, we will have two presenter. Each presenter will have 25 minutes of presentation. And at the end of the second presenter, we will have discussion for 30 minutes. 
uh, any one of you who want to have a question, you can write down on the chat at the bottom, you have the chat uh, menu, and then you just type in your question. Or if, it, you, if you want to write in Bahasa, we will try our best to translate it. So it's, uh, it's just go ahead and write. And the other option is you can go to the participant menu at the bottom as well, and then uh, choose raise hand. For that option, you, you might ask directly to the presenter. Okay, so now uh, for each presenter, I will remind if the time is only left for two minutes, then I will just interrupt saying like, your time is up, like only like two minutes left. Then you can sum, sum your presentation. Okay, before we started our present, the first presentation today, I would like to introduce the first presenter. Uh, our first presenter is Professor Anawat Supasri from Irides uh, of Tohoku University. The title of presentation is a characteristic of building fragility curve for seismic and non-seismic tsunami. Case study of the 2018 Sunda Strait, 2018 Sulawesi Palu, and 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami. Professor Anawat Supasri, affiliation is International Research Institute of Disaster Science, Tohoku University. He is a graduate, his PhD from the Tohoku University in 2010. I'm pretty sure a lot of you already know his work by a lot of his publication. And uh, his research interest is about the tsunami engineering, hazard and risk assessment, warning, evacuation, education. Without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Anawat Supasri for a uh, presentation. Please, Professor. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. This is the uh, second um, online seminar under this WCP program. I would, again, once again, I would like to repeat up what I have mentioned on the first seminar that I'm very glad that um, I could um, join this program this year, even it is in online base, but I'm happy that we can do this kind of thing and which allow people who, who are not be able to come if it's not online, right? Um, for today, um, I have prepared, oh, as in a title, which is the, mainly focus on tsunami in Indonesia, but when, after I carefully looking at the presentation titles of the, the three other presenters, um, they are all focused on the, the um, tsunami Indonesia as well. So I would like to, um, okay. Can you see my screen right now? Just in case. Yep, we hear it. We we see it very well. Okay, so I would like to spend my first maybe five or ten minutes just to um to show all of you the also the progress in Japan as well. So otherwise you will feel like okay, um, we just I think for, to give you more information about what what is going on also in Japan, and then we can discuss the compar comparison between the two countries or other countries. And um, yeah, if I, maybe I'll, I'll speak a little bit more Russian, jump from one to another, but um, I hope we have another 30 minutes for the um, discussion after um, second presentation. So yeah, please um, allow me to, then I will start right now. So um, here, um, the, the research on, on this area is actually um, start since 2004, Indian Ocean tsunami, as um, large of damage were collected in Indonesia or other country as well. And of course, but um, as you may know that 2004 Indian Ocean is the first event where we have less um, information and 
compared to other another e event like 2011 in Japan we have a lot of manpower we have more experience so that um, we can collect more detailed data and information so that uh, we can create different types of, of data or the, what we call tsunami fragility um, curve as well. Um, okay. So, I'm sorry, I don't know how to, to, to deal with, with this. Um, <laughs> just, just, can I just leave it on like this? I'm sorry. Uh, so, in general, for JD um, curve or the functions we can we can do by the few survey or numerical simulation. Of course, for the survey, if if we have uh, manpower, we can just um, do the survey and we can measure the flow depths. We can um, measure the damage directly, like the photos on the left side, but mostly. In case of big tsunami, it take more man, more time or people to to collect the, the real data. So we have another option. For example, you we can do numerical simulation to simulate the flow parameters, and we can use the satellite image to investigate the, the damage. For example, this uh, one of the photo in Mandaje, I guess, compare the photo between. Uh, before and after the tsunami, so we can see that which roof uh, still remain or not. The good thing is that of, of this one, if we have the image, we can detect the damage anywhere where we have the image, but there are some dis disadvantages. For example, if there's a lot of cloudy, so we cannot see clear the, the image, or even though the roof is still remain, but probably what inside probably mainly damage so we might um, misunder in, in the plate, interpret uh, the damage, actual damage so they are both benefit and, and disbenefit of both um, method of doing this so this table just to show you the summary of um, before 2011 tsunami, what, what kind of data we have on building damage so far. So for example, we have one in 1993 in small tsunami, small, not small, but um, limited um, damage tsunami in the west of Hokkaido. Indonesian tsunami is not only Indonesia, but also Thailand, Sri Lanka. Also, we have enough data for, for this. And, and also we could create series of fragility function as well. Also 20, 2010 Chilean tsunami or 2009 American Samoa, we also have similar research on tsunami fragility as well. And this is a summary of what have been done so far for the Japan tsunami. So because we have a lot of data, you can see um, 2000, uh, 25,000 buildings that's a lot and we have detailed data of each building like number of stories the um, types of structural types etc so we can create various type of the curves so again what is the fragility curves I, I, so let me explain the little bit more about the the meaning of this so this the the curve that of functions that show the relationship between the tsunami um, input, for example, as you can see here, the flow depth, flow velocity, or the, the force, hydrodynamic force, against the damage of the building, or it can be damage of the boat, damage of the bridge, etc. This idea of facility curve has actually has been developed that, um, in, firstly, um, in the earthquake engineering perspective and but um, for tsunami it was more popular and being applied since 2004 in the ocean tsunami you can see that um, for example even in the same 2004 Indian ocean tsunami we have the curve for uh, Indonesia which is based on the bandage data 
and also the um, another one, I'm sorry, for Thailand and others here. So you can see that even for the same flow depths, but for different countries, we have different um, damage um, probability because of the, for example, the building design criteria, etc., which make um, difficulties in applying the, the tsunami fertility to our different countries. So this is similar, so I will just skip. So what happened in Japan, um, these, these figures shows the, the area that affected by the tsunami. In 2011, the whole coast of the, the east coast of Japan. And so, for example, this is the one that I, I do the direct shift survey and we had 150 um, buildings and yeah we can can plot the curve for of the damage for different types of of damage and we also like the lower right figure we compare the damage to together with other tsunami as well so you can see that for example um with the same tsunami flow depth i'm sorry this is two meter so building in japan they sustain um they got the damage only like 10 or 20 percent compared to the, with the same flow depth um, the buildings in sri lanka they got more um, damage something like that so you can see that the building in japan in this case is stronger than what happened in sri lanka this is just an example of how we making use of the curve or in the future if we we expect that or we simulate or we expect the the height of tsunami we can guess what will be the damage to our buildings in japan um, we have classified um, the damage level like this criteria um, but different country they might have different damage criteria but this is the what we use in japan for the six damage levels and what i would like to show you here is that um, we have as you can see um, very large number of buildings in the database where we we could compare like for example um, for the red one this mean the the damage if the building will be washed away like level six like this so you can see that with the same flow depths um, for the wood and bricks masonry they have very high um, damage probability compared to other RC or steel, the first concrete or steel building with the same flow depths. Um, the damage probability is pretty low, limited to 20 or 30 percent of that. Yes. So, and another thing that we can simply say is about the, the height of the building. The left column is for the reinforced concrete, and the right column is for the wooden house. You can see that if you have just one or two story, the curve are more or less similar for both RC and, and wood. But if your building has at, at least three stories or higher, you can see that um, the curve is like just shift to the right. So the, the damage property is getting much lower if you have wood building is three, three stories or more. So we can say that when you when you decide the um, the building uh, evacuation building for example of course the steel or anything force concrete is preferable but if you have at least three stories or more the, the strength performance of the the structure against tsunami is getting much better and also we have different types of um, curve based on the types types of um, coastal topography plain or the rear course or the types of the um, the building itself whether it's just a house or storage or school public buildings etc so this kind of thing that the benefit of um, having large database with the detailed um, data of the building itself this is what we can do in Japan right now so I would like to spend the last 15 minutes just to brief to give a brief um, example of what, what we have learned from the recently um, happened 
two tsunami in Indonesia, which is the one in Palu, Sulawesi, and another one in the Sunda Strait around the Krakatoa. So I think I, I can simply um, skip some of the part that related to the earthquake tsunami itself, itself that I, I probably, um, the th three other speakers will probably um, also mention in detail. So yeah, so in general, the, the one in, in Palu was generated by the landslide, uh, sorry, the strike slip, so which is the, the fault, the move, Laterally. So normally this kind of fault will generate small tsunami or may not generate tsunami. So it's quite difficult to, to imagine that this kind of strike slip earthquake will generate tsunami in general. But um, as you can see here, like we have a kind of um, sediment in the sea and even the strike slip or lateral move can also generate the landslide tsunami like this. There's a proof in, in several field survey that um, this kind of things happen. For example, like uh, the one, the video taken from the, the aircraft showing several um, lands, uh, well, spot tsunami source as, as shown in these figures. So we have also model um, the tsunami from the several landslides. Um, under this WCP program, we have also extra, uh, do another, um, how to say, scientific transfer, like how we model this kind of landslide tsunami. So this can be, will be focused in detail on another um, workshop. And we have some several um, problems like the, the building, uh, uh, the topography data we got from the government is include the surface, so we have to remove the surface as well. And we have some um, waveform record in Pantalon that could be used to mo verify the model. So and also the run up, etc. That we and also inundation area that we could um, improve the accuracy of the model. And for the Sunda Strait, we have similarly, we work together with Baksam Sidi on using his result on the building damage as well. And we are um, applying, we are using the image before and after the, the eruption. We can estimate the volume of the collapse. Similarly, we, we did the simulation to, to get the flow characteristic of, for example, flow depth of flow velocities. And also we, we use some measurement like the waveform or the tsunami height to um, evaluate our simulation. So, so the last 10 minutes will be on the, from this experience of Palu and Sunda Strait, damage data and simulation together with 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami um, data. Um, from now, I'm sorry that the some some the the re, main result is not yet published, so I, I can I'm sorry that I can probably only see show you by by the screen, but I hope I hope that you may get some some idea. So again, so we have three three different tsunami in Indonesia. The, let me jump to this. Okay, so for the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. It was the big earthquake, and also the like in Mandaje, um, the very big earthquake, ground shaking, and then long wave because of the earthquake, and then damage. I correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I I believe that in case of 2004 in Aceh, you have less large um, liquefaction like we observe in Peru, but yeah, but this, on the other hand, in the same tsunami, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami that arrived Thailand, it was a long wave, same. But in Thailand, we have no ground shaking. So in that case, we can, if we compare the damage data from Thailand and Banda Aceh, we can see, for example, how the ground shaking influence to the damage. 
to the buildings. And if we talk about the one in Sunda Strait and Palu, for the Sunda Strait, it was generated by the flank collapse of the Krakatoa. So at that time, of course, no, no tsunami, uh, sorry, no earthquake, no ground shaking. So it's, and of course, no liquefaction. So only purely tsunami attacked the, the buildings. And that tsunami generated by the flank collapse is actually the short period um, wave as well. So we, so com by com comparing Sunda Strait and Indian Ocean tsunami in Phuket, Thailand, also we can see the difference of the impact of wave period. And for Palu, we have we have ground shaking, we have liquefaction, but the the wave period is rather short. So, as I mentioned, these three events within four different target areas is a kind of diff different characteristic and it's good to to learn by comparing this these four types of the curve however um, just our limitation is that um, of course in in Palu we we got a lot of survey data but um, uh, for the Sunda Strait I got I, I use the, the data from Time Civic, which is about 100 building, and for Thailand also from my colleague, we only have 100 buildings for the analysis. For the for the simulation, we we use the um, uh, well building as a topography data, and we we validate also using our famous um, parameters to evaluate the simulation result. I would like to skip this part. Um, yeah. So let's go through the, the, the curve very quickly. So you can see that, for example, if you compare the, you, you just quickly see the curve, the, the blue one is the Palu. So you can see that, and the green is for Banda Aceh, the black is for the for same in Thailand and Sunda Strait. So you can see that, for the small tsunami, um, the palus, the one, the curve in Palu go very high. And but unfortunately, we have less data of Palu um, beyond two or three meters. So we, it's quite difficult to to discuss the the characteristic of the Palu be, behind this. But um, what what we can see here that is that the because the in case of Palu, um, a lot large um, liquefaction already happened um, before the the tsunami arrived. So the the strength of performance of the building has been um, reduced already before the the tsunami arrived. That's why the even slow uh, even lower flow depths the the damage in Palu is higher than other tsunami. Then once we look at the Sunda Strait tsunami, this one, the wave period is very short and also the there's no ground shaking, no liquefaction. That's why even three or four meters, we, we still have um, very less um, damage, something like that. And when we compare um, the red with the, the green, so the green is for Bandaje, the long period wave uh, compared to Sunda Strait, which is short period waves. So, and then, so you can see also that uh, the, the longer period will be cause much damage to the, compared to the, the short period for Sunda Strait. Of course, it's still difficult because for um, Bandaje, there was a kind of, um, ground shaking as well. But once we compare the curve between the Phuket Thailand, which is long period, but no ground shaking, together with Sunda Strait, which is no ground shaking as well, and long short period. So you can also see that longer wave period has uh, more impact, so more higher damage compared to um, short period as well. 
So I have several slides, but we did, we did it is just they are just the repeat of what my explanation. Um, maybe it's, it's quite difficult for those who are new to the Fadi curve and this kind of um, comparison. I'm happy to 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 repeat my explanation again in more detail um, during the discussion time. So. The rests are just the, the similar thing and repeat more in detail, but I would like to end up my slide by showing uh, my presentation using this slide. So by having the different characteristics of um, 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami in Aceh and Thailand and Palu in 2018 or Sundar Strait in 2018 as well, we can compare the the characteristic of tsunami input, which is a wave period, earthquake input, ground shaking, and liquefaction. And based on our preliminary comparison, we, we would like to, we can say that um, from the, the, the curve, we can say that um, liquefaction is probably the most um, parameters or things that influence the damage of the building. The second is the ground shaking and Last but not least, also have inflation, which is the, the wave period that could also influence the building damage. Yeah, I would like to spend more later time for more detailed discussion after Park Sam City presentation. I would like to end my presentation for now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Anawat, for a very nice and comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. And then uh, now we would like to hear the present the second our presentation in our webinar. Will be presented by Dr. Shamsidik. A title of Impact of Tsunami Wave on Structure: Lesson Learned from 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami in Aceh and the 2018 Sunda Strait Tsunami. Before I uh, let Professor Samsidik to present, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Professor Sam, uh, Dr. Samsidik, uh, affiliation with TDMRC and graduated from Toyohashi University of Technology in 2009. Uh, his research interests about tsunami mitigation, disaster management, hazard and risk assessment, coastal engineering, and civil engineering. Uh, without further ado, uh, 25 minutes, Professor, uh, Dr. Samsidik, the time is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, Dr. Haikal Azifaridi. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning to all of you, um, especially to uh, Professor Khairul Munadi, the director of the DMRC, and also to uh, my colleague from IRIDES, uh, Professor Anawa Supasri. Um, thank you very much for attending this uh, seminar. Also for all the participants uh, who are very kindly that uh, registered and uh, participated in this uh, seminar. Uh, the second uh, world class professor program uh, webinar. Uh, on this occasion, we would like to continue uh, discussing about the uh, method on, on mitigating impacts of uh, tsunami. So, unlike the first, uh, for those who attended uh, the first uh, seminar last week, you still could remember that we started with uh, discussing on the, uh, how to increase. A tsunami preparedness in the region by sharing lessons learned from uh, four countries from Indonesia, uh, New Zealand, Thailand, and Japan. So I hope that from there uh, we have uh, a good start uh, to continuously discuss uh, how to mitigate, how to properly mitigate impacts of tsunami. So um, for today's seminar, um, I'm going to discuss about uh, the impacts of tsunami, especially on structures. Uh, and I would like to take uh, mainly from two cases, from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami in Aceh and the 2018 Sunda Strait tsunami. I have a couple of slides that also uh, highlight uh, the 2018 Palu tsunami, 
uh, but most of the lesson learned uh, probably uh, were derived from the two uh, tsunamis that I mentioned earlier. Um, right. So as a background, I guess we all uh, are aware that the impacts of tsunami on, on buildings are very uh, severe, uh, especially at the coastal area. And, but the challenge for us is that uh, how then we can provide a good understanding on how to mitigate the adverse impact of the uh, tsunami waves. On the other hand, <clears throat> we also need to think uh, because at, the some uh, at some location, having buildings or structures uh, around, around coastal area uh, is unavoidable. So uh, on the other hand, we need to also to understand how we better mitigate the impacts of tsunami by having a good structures that can sustain uh, tsunami waves or even can save lives. Um, so in Indonesia alone, we are informed that uh, around 80% of coastal lines in Indonesia are prone to tsunami. Um, and although this uh, hazard is a low frequent event, so like uh, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, some people say it, uh, it has recurrence period from 300 to 600,000 uh, years, or some even scientists say uh, one, one in 1,000 years. So it's very low frequent event, but we all witnessed that the impacts of the tsunami uh, are very severe and very deadliest. And in 2004 alone, we lost uh, around 230,000 people lives, not to mention how much money that we lost from that event. And in, continue, in continuing to explain to that, we understand the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami also uh, have to, uh, we have to witness another losses that we have to encounter due to the uh, 2011 tsunami in Tohoku region. So in 2004, Indian Ocean tsunami, I and my colleagues in Banda Aceh, we have uh, witnessed directly the massive destruction that uh, caused by the combination between earthquake and tsunami. Some building collapsed before the tsunami came, but some uh, sustained, but then washed away or swept away by the tsunami wave. So in this uh, presentation, I would like to focus my, my presentation on some preliminary theories, just to carry the information from uh, those who are not very uh, familiar with the theory of in impact of the tsunami waves on buildings. And the, on the end, as I'm going to also highlight some findings that uh, we found from the 2004 tsunami and also from the 2018 uh, Sunda Strait tsunami. Um, these are the figures that I quoted from some sources just to highlight what would be the, the, the deformations of the tsunami waves come from the source up to the onshore area. From the left hand side, as you can see here, so the waves uh, travel from the offshore part and propagate up to the initial part. So the wave height um, increasing, but the, the wavelengths become uh, much shorter, um, but still deadliest because it, can, it carries some forces like hydrodynamic and hydrostatic that can also uh, wash away, even wash away some um, building. Uh, most importantly, that we need to understand that some of the uh, impacts of the tsunami that we measure right now uh, was caused because of uh, the already um, broken waves. So it, it's already the waves already is has already broken, and that create what we call it tsunami board. So instead of like a full um, solitaire uh, wave or full, full form of wave. So what, what, would, what uh, impacted the, the building is already uh, uh, tsunami board. On the right hand side, so, so you can see here, there's some, some terms that we use in uh, defining the tsunami wave. So we have inundation depth that measure from the ground level to up to the water level, or we call it sometimes uh, flow depth. So as you can see the Fragility curve that we, uh, Professor Sopasi just uh, 
uh, show you this now. We, we, we use the term uh, flow depth. So it, it actually measures from the ground elevation to up to the water level. So this one, what we need to focus uh, when we measure the hydrodynamic or hydrostatic impacts of the tsunami. But apparently, uh, according to Chalk in 2015, this is the hypothetical uh, energy grid line from the tsunami wave. So you can see that this is the mean sea level before the tsunami. So when the incident of the wave uh, occur about each, it's not uh, to the height of the uh, tsunami wave. So this is the curve of the energy that we, uh, uh, that we can hypothetically understand that it decreased uh, sharply up to the uh, run-up limit of the tsunami wave. So building normally located uh, about this area. So now we need to focus on this area. So uh, why then the energy of the, the tsunami wave decreased sharply? It's, it was because of the, the waves are already broken. But if the waves still not broken, I mean, if the waves still full solitaire, solitaire wave, that's could be different story. And even uh, I think it's a very limited study have, uh, have learned about how the impacts of a full solitaire tsunami on one building, because it's very rare to see. To, uh, and I don't know if any, any literature that uh, investigated the impact of full solitaire wave on one building uh, based on uh, actual case or actual tsunami. Um, I guess some of you who learned about the energy uh, grade line in, uh, at your bachelor degree, probably you still remember about the Bernoulli uh, formula that we learned, which, is, uh, composed, which consists of the uh, uh, velocity, velocity height and then pressure height and also elevation, uh, elevation, plus elevation. So this is what this is about. And then about the tsunami wave force on building, there are five at least, and uh, what we normally uh, consider on uh, a building. One is hydrostatic forces. Uh, so it's like rho time g time h, and then hydrodynamic forces that's uh, related to velocity uh, of the wave. And then impulsive force. This is um, a force that created by sudden, uh, sudden, heat or sudden impulse of the uh, the waves that hit the the structure is very short like 0 0.3 second up to 0 0.6 second some literature mentioned but it's very high um, uh, it's almost like 1.5 uh, rho time g time h so it's quite big so i'm going later on i'm going to show you the the the, the impulsive force this is the the force that that um sometimes can cause a major, major defect or major damage to on the building. The other one that we need to consider uh, is debris-laden forces, uh, either by uh, one debris like wood, uh, wood that floating away and then heat the structure, or uh, several combined uh, debris that floating together and then heat the, um, the, the structure, all, or by my, multiple uh, times of, uh, of, uh, of impact of, of debris. That will be a different story. And the other one is uh, uh, damming debris. So it's, if the debris stop or stuck at the structure, then it will carry it and accumulate it in front of the building. That also will create what we call it um, damming debris. And the last one is the scour effect. This is mostly because of this uh, sediment transport uh, problem at the lower structures of the uh, building that can uh, create uh, instability to the structure. So the, the, the building can collapse or even um, maybe incline to some way, to some, uh, some direction and then off the top. That's uh, uh, the other forces that we need also to consider. So I guess uh, some of you who are civil engineers are, are familiar with these uh, terms. So. Uh, whether we need to uh, combine all the forces or we need to um, sum up or some of them and some of not, that uh, depends on what code that you use. So you can see the code that uh, proposed by FEMA, for example, or by ASCE, 
or the other one that uh, recently published by government of Indonesia is uh, related to the uh, code, the SNI, what is SNI? Indonesia National Standard for uh, designing uh, tsunami vertical evacuation. So that's, that's, that uh, code also include the how to uh, calculate the tsunami forces on tsunami uh, evacuation building. Um, this graph also show us the, uh, the, potent, the, the left hand side is about probability of uh, one wave to be break. So if the wave um, getting higher and higher, it getting higher possibility to, to be broken. So means that it, the wave lose its uh, energy or it has decay energy after the broken wave. And that will be dispersed. Sorry, that's why we analyze normally the tsunami wave, tsunami wave not uh, by using full uh, types or full forms of the solitaire wave, but instead we use uh, tsunami board. All more likely like we analyze uh, impacts of the flood water on, on, on the building. Although it's, it is not really identical, but maybe the, the principle of the, the flood uh, water impacts on the building is rather similar. On the right hand side, you can see that there are two basic modes of uh, how we analyze the impacts of the tsunami on building. One is when the first wave comes, like this one. So we need to calculate the impact of wave in terms of impact of force. And the second one, second one is search. So the search of the wave. Uh, then what we need to consider is the height of the wave itself. So it's, it should be like uh, the maximum water level up to the ground level. So that's what we need to do. But uh, you could remember that um, sometimes the water, sorry, sometimes tsunamis uh, has more than one wave. Or when, we, when it first receded, uh, when the first wave receded and another one come, so we, we still have water at the back of the, of the structure, like the second uh, row of the, uh, the figure. So, when, so we have uh, water at the back side of the uh, building and in front of the building. So these two parts, we need to calculate hydrostatic, but actually because the same level of hydrostatic, so we can eliminate the hydrostatic in this case. And although um, maybe in water we said that the difference between in front and, the, and at the back part of the building will be different, that means we, we need to consider the hydrostatic force. So these are the two modes that we, uh, for the simple modes that we can analyze the, the impact of the wave. So these are the, the, the case of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami in Banda Aceh. Frankly speaking, I have not done uh, any research for impacts of building uh, in Banda Aceh alone. Since then, I was away. <laughs> I was uh, not started my, my school at the time, so my, so my PhD program. So as you can see, this uh, found some publication published by Nista et al. in 2009. Um, this building show that the two stories of uh, one houses in Banda Aceh, you can see the one column, uh, it bent this way. It was assumed because of the uh, debris impacts that hit the um, column, so it's failed. So you can see that all the structure in front of this cantilever, um, it's bent and, and it's damaged in, the front, the front structures of, of the houses. Also the buildings, you can see that this is uh, the impulse impacts of the building. And the other one is what th this one, this is more on punching failure um, for the building that uh, damage not only the column, but also the beams and the wall itself. So you can see that this is all that punch uh, the building and destroy, uh, almost, almost is totally destroy the building. And this is what this so and all uh, and friends and uh, sum up from the past tsunami before the 2004 and the 2000 tsunami. Not likely as a fragility curve, as mentioned like uh, uh, by Professor Anosu Pasri, but you can see that they divided the the damage state of the building into three uh, damage state. So withstand partially damage and damage. Uh, but the Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, successfully um, fill the gap for partial damage data like this one. So for inundation depth or flow depth uh, between five to seven, you know, if even more like uh, maybe 8.5 meter, they have the data for partial damage. So 
Um, very limited data, but another good data shown by Koshimura et al. also in the same year, in 2009, but only for uh, total damage. So uh, Koshimura sensei and friends, they developed also a uh, fragility curve only for uh, washed away uh, building based on the satellite image that they saw. You know, if they identify uh, the rooftop uh, between before and after the tsunami no longer there, then they, they consider the building swept away or uh, damage state, the highest damage state they consider. So based on that, they, they create their fragility curve. I'm going to show you later on, then compare it with the 2018. Uh, tsunami uh, Sunda Strait. Um, this is the impacts of tsunami on, on waves on, on square columns. As you can see, this is the, what, what we call the impulse uh, wave forces. It's very uh, steep and very high, but shortly uh, because it's only like 0.3 seconds. But this is uh, the most worrisome forces that we need to consider when we design uh, tsunami resilient or tsunami proof, if I can say, tsunami proof building. Why this impulse happen? Because sometimes we, we create structure not really streamlined. For example, we have a column uh, in, uh, in form of square column like this one. So <clears throat> for a building that we need uh, to provide, uh, uh, so we, 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 we need to aim that uh, to have a very low impulse force on a building because that impulse force will uh, likely to damage our, our building. So uh, how? Of course, we, we need to create a streamline like we have a cylindrical uh, column instead of square column. So in that uh, regard, I think we also can explain, um, sorry, this is the type of acting forces that we need to consider again, hydrostatic, hydrostatic buoyant, hydrodynamic force and debris. And I'm going to show you this experimental work forces um, that sum up by uh, recently. I think I'm going to skip, but I'm going to show you this MOS. Uh, as I shown you earlier that the impulse force, it, the impulse force uh, is the most uh, worrisome force that we need to consider. So if we want to have a tsunami resilient or tsunami proof uh, building, I think we need to consider that we have a streamlined structure, like we have a straight cylindrical column. So that's why probably we can explain why some moss during the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami uh, were sustained, like this one. This one is Rahmatullah, sorry, Rahmatullah Moss in Lampu, Aceh Besar, uh, very close to here. Um, despite all building uh, around the moss was swept away, nothing else, just floor, as you can see this, this picture, very uh, dramatic, but only the most still there, still, still there. So why is that? So that's maybe we can explain about the impulse uh, force that I, I, I explained earlier. Same thing with the Baitur Rahim Mosque. This is very close to our office right now. I'm now at Jidia Marsi office, very close to the, this office. This is the only building left very close also to the coastline as you can see this is the uh, the, the sea or already just at the back of the moors so talking about this i think we 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 need to consider also to use uh, um, moss also an alternative escape building but not all moss can be used as escape building so one of them uh, we need to ensure that the height of uh, the the moss uh, are sufficient, at least it has two story. And secondly, it, it has a very uh, good design. Uh, for example, it has cylindrical structure, uh, good opening and so on. And we have, it, it should have um, a, 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 a way to, to reach the highest uh, level of the, the, the mosque or the rooftop of the, of, of the mosque. So some people were safe actually at this mosque and also at this mosque. Um, well, that's uh, a long story. Uh, we can talk later on about how people evacuate. Uh, so. so one of the alternatives I, I want to uh, um, repeat again that uh, this mosque or the mosque in, in Aceh or any, any place in Indonesia probably, probably we can use as, as an alternative tsunami escape building provided that we can design it to sustain uh, tsunami waves. So it should follow some procedures, of course, and some uh, assessment 
assessment in order to make it uh, feasible to be used as an alternative escape building. Right, so I'm going to speak. This is the pictures that we took from the 2018 Palo tsunami. So one of these is, uh, you can see that it's a pen of a key structure. But as you could remember the explanation from uh, Professor Anand Sopasri, some of the area in Palu, uh, it has a, a liquefaction of, of course. So it already the fund foundation failure also contributed to the uh, failures of the tsunami uh, building. And you can see this is the share uh, share crack of the the, the 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 wall that normally only happen because of uh, earthquake, not because of the tsunami. If in tsunami you just see that uh, hole like this, it is punched because of the hydrodynamic or hydrostatic. And this is from the 2018 Krakatau tsunami, uh, very uh, very close to the coastal area in what we took in Kali. Um, let me remember. Uh, in Kalyanda, in Kalyanda district, in southern part of uh, Lampung, um, uh, you can see that because the, the height of tsunami uh, in this area is not just like, uh, I need to check, but it's around two, uh, two meters. So, uh, but in the case of Krakatau tsunami, uh, there is no ground shaking at all, no leaky function. So it's purely because of uh, hydrodynamic forces. I mean, it's purely because of tsunami wave forces. Unlike Banda Aceh, it was started or it was generated because of earthquake, already ground shaking happened. And also in Palu, there were uh, ground shaking also uh, followed by uh, coastal li uh, liquefaction and then tsunami damage. It's combined between the that three forces. But unlike in the, um, with the, those two uh, tsunami, this Krakatau tsunami is very unique and interesting because if you want to see the impact of hydrodynamic force alone, this is the case that we need, uh, we need to focus on. Um, this is the, uh, one of the elementary schools. I'm going to show you the school where it's based later on. And this is the structures of um, semi-permanent house. One semi is the first floor is uh, with uh, 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 confined uh, uh, bricks, uh, masonry, but the second floor was wooden. So it lost uh, column over here. And this one very close also to this building. Uh, the floor depth here we measure about 3.6 meter. So you can see that the whole part of the, almost the whole part of the, the, the houses was uh, destroyed. Uh, so it lost walls, whatever there, but it can sustain some part, which is actually just, um, bathroom or toilet of the house uh, that's the only part that sustained but the rest are will disappear so well i'm going to skip this one so we measure actually some flow depth and and we also uh, understand there is a kind of bend like this uh, uh, tie column that we we observe from one building and how we measure the uh, flow depth we sometimes we have to, to find uh, some watermark or we we could identify some tsunami deposit at a stairway like this one so we measure from the ground floor up to this uh, sediment where we found so that how we did uh, the uh, investigation during the 2018 and this so is the only have two more minutes all right i'm going to uh, conclude yep. by the way so this one of the largest tsunami boulder that we found uh, very interesting this is my colleague actually, um, Benazir, is going to present later on. It, 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 it was even higher than him. Um, all right. Um, well, this is one, one of the most uh, epic, if I, get, I can say, uh, pictures of the impact of the 2018 tsunami that show the inundation, uh, tsunami inundation limits, and one of the elementary that I showed you earlier, and wave directions and how this uh, area was uh, totally damaged within like 50 to 80 meters uh, from the coastline. Despite there is a sea dike over here uh, that was constructed like past 2.5 from uh, mean sea level. All right, so, um, well, the other one is about the story of the wooden houses. We found that uh, if the tsunami waves higher than two meter, it can sweep away uh, ha wooden houses like this one. But if the tsunami wave, uh, in the case of 2018 tsunami, of course, 
Uh, if tsunami wave lower than two meter, it can create partially damaged, uh, especially lower part of the houses like this one or like this one. So that's um, what we can observe from the Tsunami system. Okay. Um, this is the fragility curve that we, we got from the 2018 tsunami. So I think the other one, this one, the dash line, is for the 2004 tsunami that uh, concluded by Koshimura uh, for the completely wash away uh, building. So I think we, if we need to uh, quickly uh, compare, we need to compare between the red line and the dash line. So the red line mm -hmm. of the this one of which is actually both of them are completely washed. So you can Sorry, someone. So if you can understand that the 2004 tsunami here in Banda Aceh, the um, the graph is to, tends to the left hand side. It means that it's it's the quality, in other words, the the strength of the the building or the houses. Uh, are were weaker, uh, were weaker compared to the 2018 case uh, of tsunami. Well, one of the explanation uh, was because of the 2004 tsunami was initiated by earthquake, so there was ground shaking started and then tsunami. But in 2018 tsunami, there was no ground shaking, so purely because of uh, hydrodynamic force. So that's the different of the two graph. Um, all right, I'm going to skip because my time is about to up. Now, I'm going to conclude at the end of this presentation that uh, each tsunami is unique, all right? Uh, in my opinion, there is no tsunami is identical to each other in terms of effect of tsunami on building. That was because need, we need to consider the source and the forces, of course. Uh, what we mean uh, the forces that the forces that generated before the tsunami during the propagation of the tsunami or even after the the first propagation uh, the tsunami wave propagated and the the third one was uh, the types of the building in one location because the type of the building in indonesia or even in, in within indonesia in banda Aceh may be different if we talk uh, the building in uh, southern part of java i mean in terms of the rooftop for example, in Java, you are, um, my friends in Java, they like to use uh, tile roof, but in in Sumatra or in Banda Aceh, we normally use zinc roof. So that's also could uh, change the perspective uh, or the analysis. And understanding to what impact of tsunami forces on building could help us to one, mitigate impact of tsunami, provide alternative escape building, and of course, yeah, the, the utmost objective is to save lives. Uh, I think the third uh, conclusion you can read by yourself, it's more likely to explain about the prejudice group that I just mentioned earlier. So thank you moderator, thank you the participant for listening to my presentation. So I now uh, turn the, my time to uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Samsidik for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Now we will go through the discussion for 30 minutes. As I remind earlier, you can write down your question on the chat menu at the bottom, or you can just simply raise your hand by choosing the participant menu and choose the raise hand option. I have noted uh, a lot of questions already, and some of them I already listed. I will show to you uh, for the list question. Okay, wait a second. I have some more uh, question being brought in. So I just copied the last, the last question. Then I will just show the share screen. Okay. Yep, uh, is anyone see this? screen of the question okay yes, so yes, i can see yeah we have uh and now we have three questions for professor anawat and another three question for dr samshiri so who who will go first <laughs> okay maybe, maybe professor read. anawat yeah let, uh, let me read the question first yeah 
Yeah, can can you see it clearly or I need to? Yeah, yeah, it? yeah. It's clear. It's clear. Okay, that's good. Loading with the form of a bridge. Yes. Second. Okay. Thanks for the number. Yeah. So it's make us easier. Yeah. When. The, Okay, I'm not sure about the first question. Maybe I would like to ask them to clarify a little bit. So let, let me answer number two and number three first. Okay, so number two. Yeah. Uh, yes, actually the damage state we use in our analysis. Um, uh, there are two big types of the, the damage states. The first one, um, for following my um, colleagues in, in Thailand, they only consider um, whether the structure is structural or non-structural, uh, no, sorry, um, structural member or non-structural member, which means, for example, the wall or roof, glass window, something like that, they consider it as uh, non-structure because even the wall, well, in case of Thailand or in Japan, even the wall was broken or roof was broken, um, the building still remain. But if column or the the slab or foundation or beams we consider as the structural members, so they classify into based on this structural or non non structural or not. But in Japan, as I have shown you in one slide, that um, they classify into six damage levels or, or states, which depends on the. It's not for the first one about the structural member or not. It's, I think I would say based on the engineering judgment. But, um, but the second one used in, in Japan is, is based on if the building can be um, repaired or not or something like that. So it's uh, quite different in, for, for each um, damage state classification. And so when we want to generate them, I say, are there any factors that must be considered? Yeah, so uh, I, I would say that, of course, we have to, to consider the engineering perspective, but on the other hand, like what we did in Japan, they also consider if the, the building can be generated or not. After this, I will show you the, the slide that um, for the damage state in, in Japan for your further clarification. And the third question, like reflection, yeah, sorry for, for my explanation, maybe I, I did rather quick. Um, we found that when we compare the curve with the, between the Palu and another um, case, even very small flow depths. Okay, let, let me show you. So can I share my screen? Sure, I will stop mine and then goes to yours. Yeah, yeah. Is okay right now? Yep, we can see it. Yeah. I think I'm not sure if I have the one. Yeah, also, for example, something like this. So even with these small um, flow depths from the curve, we can see that Palu got the highest damage compared to other tsunami. In fact, um, what if we compare the, the flow depths, oh, sorry, the force, tsunami force itself, um, the, from the simulation, we can see that the force from at, of the tsunami, of velocity and the force, velocity on the left and the force on the right, we can wow. see that um, the case of Panda J2004 and Krakatau uh, in Sunda Strait in the, in the red, is higher than Palu. So that means, like what um, Sam Sik has mentioned in his presentation, he mentioned about the force that um, related to the damage of the building. So you can see from our simulation as well that even the force of Aceh and Palu uh, and Sunda Strait is higher than Palu. But if you consider um, only the throw depth that we can observe from the field survey, you can see that. Um, actually, even the lower flow depths, 
the because of liquefaction that happened in in Palu that generate um, already damaged the building or the building re was the performance was reduced by the liquefaction before the tsunami arrived. That um, the damage is higher than in Palu. So, so, so what we can say also from this is that um, if you we really use the flow depths, we might cannot be explained other um, the real characteristic of of the damage because. As you can see here, even if we're looking at the force, tsunami force only, the Palu is low. But of course, this kind of plot, we cannot in, in, um, interpret the uh, liquefaction as in a simulation. So that this is kind of good finding from our lesson from learning by comparing this, this curve. And for the second question, I would like to show you the, the criteria of the damage there that we use in Japan. Of course, we also, from the description, they, they discuss about the damage to the structure, slight damage, heavy damage to some part of the wall, to heavy damage to several walls or something like that. But also they have another perspective, like um, if the, the building can be repaired or non-repair or something like that. So I think both structure, structural perspective and economical perspective is um, also important to to create the the damage state. Can you go back to your document again? The first question. Can can I read again? Yeah, with the form of operation. Yeah, I'm I'm not. I'm not quite sure about the the question like the with the form of the bridge can can you please clarify a little bit or while I'm waiting I think I have another question at 11 51 yeah yeah there are two questions we need to clarify the types of the building yes 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 for example yeah, I agree with you that that's why in my presentation in Japan, we we classify the fragility functions based on different types of uh, uh, buildings. And but for Indonesia, um, maybe I would like to hear from from Sam Siddiq about his um, opinions about the buildings in Palu, in his survey data survey area in around the Sunda Strait as well. Maybe if if my comparison that I have just shown you what, what we have to consider or limitation of the comparison of the curve that I just showed you. And second question, how we classify the building damage? Go by quick, answer me. Oh, okay. So for the second question, question number five, um, in case of like Mandaje is quite difficult, frankly speaking, because it's um, very fast and difficult to see, but in case of Japan, um in case of japan we 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 could say that the the building in japan itself is quite strong and there was almost no damage by the building because they were follow the building code guideline or something like that so um the the, the damage data what we obtain is we can say is is uh, mainly from from or purely from from the tsunami itself Okay, and just now the meaning of my question regarding the bridge is Indonesia, what is called building is also the bridge. Ah, okay. In Japan, yeah, if you talk about, we have the word of building, which is the building. So I don't think um, we will, uh, people will not get confused. So of course, we, in Japan, we are, in case of 2011 tsunami, we also have um, damage, damage of the bridge data and some one of my colleagues he also developed the curve for the bridge as well so yeah, that's another yeah just for your information yeah uh, thank you very much for the answer professor uh, Anawat now uh, later on I will check again if the if there is any other question at the chat but we still have a lot of times so we will later on probably gonna be back to you, Professor Anawat. So now is uh, Dr. Samsidik. 
there is a number of questions. So yeah, you just please choose which one that you want to answer the first. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I saw some of them are quite difficult. So. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Master Moderator, and also uh, participant who uh, asked the question to me. Um, I'm trying my best to respond to all of your questions. Uh, number one from uh, Ibu Widayani. Uh, was liquefaction not included in the impact of tsunami or exactly does liquefaction work? Uh, well, what we've seen in, in uh, if you talk about uh, impact of tsunami in terms of uh, a fragility curve, uh, we only see a uh, result, not the process. So. What we see, what we have seen in, in, in the graph that's shown either by uh, Professor Supasri or by me, it's only the result or the impacted, uh, the impacted building, not the process that um, preceded the, uh, the, the destruction of the houses. So how then uh, we include in that process, it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it kind of pre-analysis pre of, the, of the impact, not the graph itself. So the, the graph itself, if nobody tell you that this is the graph from uh, Palu or this is the graph from Krakatau, nobody know whether uh, any any different uh, of the mechanism of the, the tsunami or the, uh, the process that generated the tsunami uh, fragility curve. Uh, how the exactly does liquefaction work? Uh, well, uh, if you are talking about the physical impact itself, not the curve, the physical impact itself, of course, that when the first when the earthquake happened, it can uh, damage the uh, first the wall and because it can you know uh, put diagonal crack to to the wall, and then if the liquefaction followed after that, it can settle some part of uh, of the building, so the building become uh, tend to incline to some direction or even then uh, fall down then come with the uh, tsunami wave, it can add some more uh, adverse impact on that. So that's why we, we consider uh, all these three events uh, in uh, our result in, 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 in Palu, for example, but not in, in, in Banda Aceh, which uh, mostly was dominated because of earthquake plus uh, tsunami. Yes, there was uh, some location where liquefaction uh, were identified, but not uh, as, uh, massive that we found in, in, in Palu, for example. But interestingly, in, in, in Sunda Strait, as you understand that nothing uh, happened before the, so the first wave came. So no ground shaking, no, no liquefaction, of course. So it's only hydraulic force. So that how we, we create the, the fragility curve and how we analyze the, the process. I hope that I can answer your question. The second one, um, a from Mr. Da Silva, could you explain about the formula for each other? Uh, yeah, I, yo, well, um, without going back to uh, my slide, I can, uh, um, I can explain to you uh, briefly that uh, those uh, formula were generated based on laboratory experiments. So the, the laboratory experiments, um, the wave that generated in the flume uh, were different. So some of them were generated using dam break. Gate, and then water in the back of the gate, and then the gate suddenly opened and we call it dam break. Right, so. And then the other, the other experiment were performed using a solitaire uh, wave. So it's really a wave, a solitaire wave. And uh, that's why the difference between one formula and the other formula. Secondly, why they are different? Because one experiment using, uh, um, using dry bed, you know, dry, bed uh, dry bed experiment means that nothing in front of of the building, there's no water at all from before the, the, the water came, the first wave of tsunami came. But the second one is was with uh, a certain level of, of uh, water in front of the building. So it's, there is 
there, there was already uh, a certain level of, of the world and then the wave, the tsunami wave was generated uh, to impact the building. So that why did uh, those uh, formula were different mainly. But in detail, I can send you um, uh, the papers related to the formula if you want. You, you can drop your email to my email and I'll send you later on for uh, your references. And uh, why the, the uh, okay, number three also from Mr. Da Silva. Before conclusion, why blue dots match with blind and but the other lines to some dot match, some does not. Well, um, this fragility curve, actually, if you see only 10 dots, for example, it's not 10 uh, data. It was actually some up from some hundreds or even in case of uh, Anawat Sopasri, they, generated more than 200,000 uh, data. Um, so then all the data were clustered, all right? All the data were clustered into uh, damaged states. So we have uh, five damaged states from uh, minor, no, not from minor, from no damage, minor, uh, I forgot, minor, moderate, uh, severe, and- Complete. Sorry, Complete the damage. Uh, complete. Completely was away. So we have five states of the damage. Uh, so all the hundred data we cluster into that those those five uh, uh, damage states. Of course, when we analyze one building, we need to you know to think about why this building was classified into one certain damage state. Uh, so maybe it's between damage state two to damage state three. So we cannot say that damage state two point five. It should be decided with two or three. So that's why the dot sometimes uh, sometime not fit with the, the, the curve. And it, it is about a statistical uh, approach actually. So if I guess uh, for simply uh, explanation, I can tell you that it's kind of normal, normal distribution that we follow one certain line and we try to fit when one model uh, we're using uh, logarithmic uh, equation or natural logarithmic uh, equation of the fragility curve. So there are two, two, mostly there are two types of fragility curve that we can follow. Um, so that my question, uh, I'll respond to you. The other one from Fasatrio, I'm interested in a MOS. <clears throat> how you survey counted, sorry. How many MOS can be used? Uh, well, yes, uh, thank you Fasatrio. Actually, um, this is a rather new uh, research that uh, we started together with my uh, PhD students. Uh, so we, we actually want to assess how many MOS that can be uh, feasible for evacuation building. So similar, we will start to analyze the MOS using the fragility curve. This is rather difficult because no data, uh, no MOS, no data for the damaged MOS uh, actually uh, uh, available right now. So we need to go to the field and reconstruct again the type of the, 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 the moss before the tsunami and then try to analyze the damage state and it's kind of very uh, long process and could contain some bias also because it, you know we need to do some qualitative and quantitative assessment and then we need to, to create a fragility curve specifically for a moss. And later on, uh, we will assess how many building or how many moss in, in Banda Aceh, Aceh Besar, or even the whole Aceh can, can be uh, classified as an alternative escape building for that area. I hope that within these two years, we can give some result later on. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, my student and I will uh, love to share when we, we have the result. And the other thing, the other question from Dofi Pandara from Unsrat, thank you for question. Any open source to assess the interaction of tsunami infrastructure? There are, there are sir, uh, is it sir or uh, ma'am? There, there are a number of open source that you can use, but in the meantime, we here at TDMRC, we use uh, dual SPH uh, to assess the uh, numerical model for interaction between um, wave and, and, and structures. Uh, it's kind, it can be very hectic, but uh, also you need to invest a lot of, uh, uh, well, invest for somehow some amount for uh, a good computer, uh, because if we, we want to mitigate um, uh, the real situation of one uh, of tsunami affected area, it, it, it's quite 
um, time consuming and also cost consuming uh, because we use a uh, massless par particle and uh, but in the meantime we still try to use uh, one one model so it's kind of physical model and then we put it again in, in the world sph uh, to what extent potential tsunami needs to have been mapped either subduction earthquake or volcanic avalanche and it impacts coral structure um well for the subduction earthquake uh it's it is much better if i can say right now uh, so we uh, together with the government uh, of course the government of indonesia together with uh, other uh, research institute, including with the DMRC, we have uh, met several locations where the potential uh, tsunami generated uh, because of the tectonic activities. For example, in certain part of Java, my colleagues from uh, Java, they are uh, doing a lot of uh, work to map the certain part uh, of Java uh, tsunami. And also we here in, in Banda Aceh, we, we are doing um, number of numerical simulation and, and also investigation for uh, western part of, of, of Sumatra, including in West Sumatra, even some uh, investigation we did it in, in small island up to Bengkaru, sorry, no, Bengkaru, was it? Engano, Engano Island in, in Bengkulu even. So that's for this uh, tectonic, but uh, for other sources like land, um, landslide, for example, or even uh, like the case of 2018 tsunami in Palu, I, I, in my opinion, we are still uh, trying to figure out where are the potential source of the uh, uh, landslide tsunami that can occur in Indonesia. So some are have been identified, of course. Uh, for example, in in offshore of of Padang city of West Sumatra, and and of course in in Bengkulu uh, and and in Sunda Strait and some other area of in, in some of location in eastern part of including in um, Ambon, Ambon Bay, Ambon Bay of, uh, of Maluku. So that's what, what I can respond to you. Uh, others? Is this for me, for number six in India? Yes, uh, that's one for you too, six and seven. Okay, sorry. <laughs> there are escape structure building in Orissa State with high elevation dome shape. Are there, are there any structure built in Banda Aceh based on past tsunami? You mean for escape building, right? So in Banda Aceh, we have uh, six official um, escape buildings that constructed uh, after the 2004 tsunami. They were constructed between 2000, um, 2006, between 2006, 2009. So we have uh, six uh, buildings. Each of the, the building can accommodate like 800 uh, people, uh, around 800 people. Uh, of course, they are not enough to accommodate on the whole um, uh, people that who are prone to tsunamis in this city. But um, yes, uh, that's why we, we, we need to look for an alternative escape building, for example, like uh, the mosque that we have a plenty mosque in Banda Aceh. But if you ask me about whether we had that before the 2000 tsunami, no. Unfortunately, yes, there, is, there was no escape building at all before the 2004 tsunami. Even I think some of us, uh, most of us, if I, uh, if I can say, most of us were not familiar with the tsunami at all. So that's why the number of uh, casualties here were very high. So last uh, from me or Sir Utusangi. How about effectiveness of mangrove formation to decrease the impact of tsunami of wave forces? Is there any specific particular form or particular form that can be mimicked to specific engineered building or rock that can protect the coastal area from massive impact? All right. Um, well, mangrove forest uh, is effective uh, to mitigate impact of tsunami wave force if the tsunami wave force lower than six meters. So you can imagine that uh, in the case of 2004 tsunami, um, in, in average, uh, the wave height of the tsunami along the coast of the Bandache was 12 meters. So I think even we have mangrove forests, it maybe can play a um, minor effect to reduce the impact of tsunami itself. Um, so 
yes, it can be, uh, mitigate effectively tsunami if this, the intensity of the tsunami is uh, smaller than six meter, for example. So that's what I can understand from uh, li literature or uh, practice research done by other, other researchers. Um, but I, we suggest to have uh, coastal forests, of course. Um, it, I, I'm saying that the tsunami larger than six meter doesn't mean that I'm against the idea of having coastal forests or mangrove forests in the city. No, uh, I'm, a, I'm totally agree to have having coastal forests or mangrove forests uh, to mitigate impact of tsunami. Uh, but we don't need to stick only with the mangrove forests, which mainly are located uh, along the, the, the coast, uh, right? Or swampy area of the coast. But also we can um, activate or create other like uh, forests, uh, like city forests, inland uh, forests, because it can trap debris. So when once a tsunami happens, it can trap debris. As I mentioned earlier, the impacts of debris to the building is also very severe. So if the forest can stop the debris, it can reduce somehow uh, the damage that caused by the tsunami waves. So that what I can, the last one also, this is from me. Um, oh, I just uh, answer. Yeah, both, both can answer. Some, some oh. of those are already answered by the chat forum, but uh, please, yeah. Professor Anawad, if you, have, if you want to uh, let us uh, know about the answer, uh, please uh, repeat again. Yeah, I think, well, yes. please, Anawad. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, so what I have mentioned in the chat already is about the size of of the well, the fault and size of the, the landslides are different. So, so yeah, that um, related to the 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 length of the wave. So that's that's thing. And of course, yeah, that that's that's the main thing. But the races are related to the bathymetry and etc. So that's make more complicated. I would like to add two things that I. I, one thing is about the 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 mangrove that uh, some city has just mentioned. Yeah, so in Jap that's why in Japan we um, after 2011 tsunami we make um, countermeasure based on two types of tsunami: level one and level two. Level one is like 2004 to two, or 2011, very big tsunami every 5,000 uh, 500 or 1,000 years. Of course, in that size. No seawall, no, no mangrove, no whatever. Of course, we can build seawall twenty meter, but it's not practical. So in that size, we would say to save life only, not not the the fully protection. But um, if for the smaller tsunami, if of course, right now we we still have um, potential of like magnitude earthquake seven point five or eight or something like that like in Palu or something. So in that case, we still need a certain level of um, countermeasure, the seawall or the, the mangrove. Of course, this can be helped to mitigate uh, the impact of the level two or more frequent tsunami that could often come like every hundred year or something. This is my, just to add up um, the same city and question on question eight, ah, seven. And another thing about the damage state, I, I forgot to mention one thing. I think my question, question to me, number two or three, that um, even we, we found that the in, in Japan, um, even they have the, the damage classi classification of the level, we, we found that um, some damage level there were very less number of buildings classif classified to that level so that's because um, the definition of the damage level is not so clear. So the people in the field, once they look at the building, they and they read the definition of each damage level, they probably um, assign the damage to number four or to number six. So less, very less damage to number five, something like that. So. Oh, I would like to say that the definition of the damage level also very important so that otherwise people in the site may probably misinterpret in, in interpret the meaning or definition of the damage. Yeah, this just for me. Uh, maybe Dr. Samsidi, you want to add something? Um, no, uh, I think I, I let uh, uh, Professor Anawat to also respond to the last question from Pajati. 
this one the last one at 10 10 13 yes 10, 13. which is better when we try to assess the video consider the potential for shaking due to earthquake consider the wave for the uh yes of course we we have to to be more conservative i i'm i'm sure that um we we better um, consider the, the, the ground shaking for japan is kind of uh, In Japan, it's exceptional case as the the building is quite strong, and um, the we we follow we, we really follow the building code. But in other the rest of the world, I yeah we should also consider the potential ground shaking, and so maybe it's more conservative. It's, it's, it's better, in my opinion. But still, yeah, uh, the but the debris is still very difficult for the moment. <laughs> for everyone yeah thank you yeah uh thank you it's very it's very nice discussion that we have in the first session i i'm really happy to to receive a lot of questions from the participant um i'm pretty sure still more coming in uh but uh we are on the time now for the joining the second session of the presentation but before that some of the key um, key notes that I can uh, write down is the the first one is the the field surface simulation are very important at the moment in in order to get this uh, a precise uh, measure of the hazard that will will be impacted from the tsunami and then uh, the second one is the the construction type even the the building of building year that's also uh, in, uh, very influence how this uh, damage being happen if the building being impacted by tsunami and uh, the types of the source of the tsunami some of the tsunami can can be resulted from the ground shaking and then have the tsunami some of them without shaking we have the submarine landslide and then uh, create the tsunami and uh, uh, the thing is the the, the force that acting uh, on a tsunami are different uh, from case to case so this this is uh, the thing that we need to model and to understand how it will be impacted to the building so those are the key key notes that i write down but please correct me if i'm wrong we can still write down on the chat so later on at the end of the uh the second session where we have again two presenter each one have 25 minutes and 30 minutes of discussion i will sum up all the important point at the end and then uh, uh we write down uh for the for the concluding remarks for this uh, webinar that we have today so without uh spending more time i would like to invite our third speaker for today is uh, dr yunita idris with the uh, with uh, before i let her present i, I will just say the title Developing Fragility Curve of Archetypes Houses in Aceh from Field Assessment of Pidijaya and Bener Maria Earthquakes. Uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Yunita Idris' uh, uh, background. Uh, she is affiliated with DMRC, a PhD from the University of Adelaide in uh, 2000 and 2018, is that right? No, it's 2016. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 2016. Then uh, uh, her research interest is about the vulnerability assessment of building in high seismic area, post-disaster assessment of building structures, seismic resistant structural material development, and uh, recycled construction material. Without further ado, uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Yunita Idris. Your time is 25 minutes. If, if it's less than two minutes, I will just interrupt. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, for uh, the chance, for the opportunity to share uh, my preliminary result about the fragility curve of uh, uh, PD Jaya earthquake field assessment and also Bernard Maria. But uh, could you 
please let me to be the host because <laughs> I leave left before because of the audio problem. Uh, afternoon now, no, uh, or is it still morning? Okay, good morning everyone. Good day. Uh, 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 and good morning also to uh, me, uh, Professor uh, Anawat Spasi for uh, and also uh, Dr. Samtidi for uh, very interesting explanation about the tsunami impact and also the fragility curve of the tsunami uh, to the building. Uh, and I, I uh, and right now, uh, even though it's not really uh, related to the tsunami, but I think uh, I need to to present some of the what what we found for uh, during the developing fragility curve of archetype residential uh, residential uh, houses in Aceh based on the case study of the Bener Maria earthquakes in 2013 and uh, Pidijaya earthquake in 2016. So a little bit background, uh, I think uh, the fragility curve is uh, really important to see, uh, uh, to, to measure the vulnerability of the building, but uh, Yes, uh, in, uh, at this moment, I will try to uh, concern about the fragile, uh, earthquake fragility curve uh, that can be used, uh, yeah, mostly can be used uh, by tool, yeah, by uh, empirical methods and analytical approach method. Um, and at this, uh, at this occasion, I will explain a little bit a little bit about the empirical methods that are based on the post earthquake field surveys and and this type of method uh, and this method it could be considered to be like a most reliable source because it's related to the actual condition of the building performance but both of the methods have the like a uh, cost and benefit i mean the pro uh, pro and cons as well What 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 the difference between the two methods? Like the method, the first method, the empirical method, like I said before, is about uh, is based on the uh, uh, the, the the post survey, post post earthquake survey for for the uh, the earthquake fragility curve, and it's limited to the um, what the intensity uh, assessment uh, in the in the field. Uh, so and uh, sometimes it's uh, subjective, subjective to the subjective evaluation. Like uh, uh, you, you rely on the expert judgment and uh, not very much detail about uh, the uh, like analytical method. Analytical method is usually based on the static and dynamic nonlinear analysis of the model building that we model the building and then uh, put the uh, some of uh, the detail about the location, about the about the model of the building, the material, and also about the uh, the typical of the earthquake itself. So considering the the limitation of the both methods, uh, so we all, we 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 found that some uh, uncertainty factors for developing of the fragility curves. So it's quite challenging to uh, develop the fragility curves itself. So, but uh, but both the methods is uh, it's also uh, it's still a derivation of the relationship between a peak ground acceleration and a micro seismic intensity. The 
process of the fragility curve development that I did for the empirical method, this empirical method. So we collect the data, the data from the previous earthquake, the data including the data, uh, I will explain later about which data that we collected for uh, developing the uh, fragility curve based on the empirical methods. And then later on, we will have uh, uh, identify the damage state, uh, what, what damage state that we use and uh, the criterion of the limit state damage. Uh, so we, I, I will explain a little bit, a little bit, a little bit about the, what is the damage state and what is the limit state damage because uh, uh, people tend to, uh, I mean the Hazus, Hazus, uh, one of the uh, uh, yeah, I mean the limit state and limit state limit. I, I will uh, criterion. It will uh, later on be uh, explained. And then uh, we will try to find the peak ground acceleration. I mean, uh, try to measure the peak ground acceleration from uh, the location information, and uh, and then and then try to develop in the fragility curve. So this is what I mentioned previously, but the data collection. So what we done for the developing the fragility curve, yeah, what, what we need, that, what data that we need for uh, developing the fragility curve, that we need the different type of the construction. We need to identify what type of the, uh, what type of construction of the horses that we assess in the field. And then the number of horses of each, the construction types, and the number of the damage house, and then criteria, uh, I mean the, the, the criteria of the damage states of each house. And at this, at this stage, it, it quite uh, challenging for the assessment of the damage states of the horse, like uh, that high, that ha have been explained by uh, Professor Anawat that uh, it tends to have the like subjective, uh, uh, I mean, based on the perception of the surveyor as well for the domestics. And then the location and the coordinate of the houses and, and then based on the domestic, we, we can have the measure intensity based on the damage situation. Okay. Now, uh, what is the archetype of the residential houses in Aceh? So, uh, there are three major types of um, archetype of the main construction of the residential houses in Aceh that we can grouping into like one is timber construction or wood construction where the house is made from the uh, the main construction of the house is made from uh, wood timber. Uh, the of the house is made from the wood or something. It's still, uh, uh, yes, some of the house are still built using the timber construction. And then the next one is a mason or confinement building. I'm not sure about the masonry, it's not quite common now. Masonry we call as uh, most of the building in uh, Aceh now practically confined masonry. Confined masonry is like uh, the, uh, the, the house is made from the Oh wow, I uh, think we have some internet problem with uh, Dr. Unida. I think she's back. Yep, yep. Please continue, Dr. Unida. Your, 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 your microphone is still mute. Yep. So it's happened from the beginning, no? 
Uh, no, it's at the RT type building. It's two types, okay. wooden and uh, the other types. Okay. Okay, sorry. Technical issue. Okay. Uh, so, um, I'll explain about the masonry and confined masonry building. Confined masonry building is a kind of the building that made from the clay brick with a tight column and the tight uh, uh, beam that we consider as the frame, the small frame. But mostly the the building itself is uh, the major the major construction and uh, who support the load of the construction is the the, the masonry or, or, or wall. That's why we call it as the confined masonry building. Now, uh, the third type is the reinforced concrete frame buildings, where the major, uh, I mean, the main construction is made from the reinforced concrete for the frame, and then uh, with the infill uh, clay brick or wall uh, that made from uh, brick or the mortar, mortar uh, brick, clay brick or mortar brick. So. Mostly, uh, it's for the two-story or three-story, uh, like uh, more than one story of the building, like the, the in the picture, the house in the picture. Now, what is the earthquake damage state in Indonesia? So we, based on the Peraturan Menteri Pekerjaan Umum number twenty-two. RTM 2018, there are three major types of the damage state. It's uh, classified as the three damage state, which are the slight damage, where uh, most of the, uh, the, the damage uh, uh, come from, uh, only happen on the non-structural uh, member of the houses, like the uh, like uh, only a small crack in the wall, but the wall still uh, like uh, stand it, and uh, windows and a roof for the uh, the the tile of the uh, of the roof itself, not for the uh, for for the the, the the main construction of the the, the roof, uh, and for the moderate damage that we found like diagonal crack and also the, the, the large crack on the wall for the masonry, for the house, and for the reinforced concrete and also, uh, so the main, the main construction already, uh, already have uh, uh, damage, but still can be uh, repaired. For the C, uh, the, the third category, the heavy damage, like uh, it's a uh, the damage already happened in the main uh, main construction of the building, like the wall is already collapsed and also the the column already like bent and uh, the roof almost uh, gone and yes that the heavy damage is uh, nearly to the uh, the collapse. Uh, I I couldn't find any like a percentage uh, of the whole damage to criteria to categorize the, uh, the damage for the for all of the three types. So then we use the uh, earthquake damage states of Hazus, like the, the 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 damage state description is divided into four uh, categories from slight, moderate, uh, extensive, and uh, complete. So yesterday I got from the Kowloon et al. in 2017, they, they summarized from the hazards for the damage state uh, description and also the limit state description. What is the damage state? Damage state is the category into like four, La, slight, moderate, extensive, and complete. What is the limit state description? Limit state, um, damage, damage state mean like uh, the description like, uh, oh, there are the minor deformation of the roof and diaphragm uh, connection and higher line, higher line cracks in the few 
welded rules and connection like that. Uh, what we call as the hairline cracks is the crack not not, uh, not happen into whole uh, wall. I mean, uh, it's not uh, it's not connected into the the other 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 part of the wall. I mean, only on the surface of the wall. And the limit state description description is like considering about the four percent until uh, two percent and fifteen percent for the roof half cover failure. And wall failure is considering it's not really uh, uh, not really much of percentage, even it can be called as non uh, non percent of the building like uh, uh, damage. For the moderate. The moderate is like more than 15% of the, 15 to 35% of the building are like uh, 15 and 15 and to 35% of building damage to the whole structure. And uh, for the extensive is like more than 35 uh, to, to 80%, but then the complete is at 80. 80 percent, more than 80 percent, it's called a complete uh, damage or less. So this is how to like uh, uh, developing the limit uh, to to not take the part the limit state image where this uh, about uh, for the structural capacity where the structure is come to the yield position is still called like a still uh, the slight damage until it reach the uh, more uh, it's until it reach yield, yield uh, point so it's still like a, a slight damage and then when it got when it reached the ultimate and then slightly shift from the ultimate it's called uh, the moderate and then uh, completely damaged or extensive damage beyond that point so this will be uh, what we need to uh, developing the fragility curve for the earthquake now the field record damage from the Bernard Maria earthquake in 2013, I got the data from our college, from, uh, uh, Dr. Mubara and uh, Fen, and also Ibn Rushidi. And for, for, for the PDJ earthquake, we got the data from uh, our field assessment in 2016, also from the data of the, uh, the BPBD uh, PDJ. And for for kind of the slight damage that we uh, found is like uh, like this feature slight damage where the the damage is only considered for the higher line cracks on the wall and no major uh, no uh, uh, visual damage on the main construction like this type of the building we consider as the confined masonry building. And and there are no like a uh, separate wall from the type beam, uh, type beam and the type uh, column, and also no uh, coming through a crack like a crack more than like one centimeter from the wall. And for the sorry for the moderate damage that we can see the, here is a. Uh, the, the terrace of the house is already like uh, uh, like uh, leaning. I mean, it's uh, it's not like uh, can hold the the roof for the terrace, but majority of the houses. The majority of the the construction is uh, still uh, stand stand standing, uh, but the but some of the houses got uh, like like this house is yes, uh, the uh, some of the uh, the wall is already like uh, uh, crack and uh, 
fall down a little, a little bit, but still can be uh, repaired. And for the extent, extent uh, extensive damage, like this house is still standing, but it's already like uh, some of the wall. And, uh, but, uh, but not, uh, but mm, not disturb uh, for the whole performance of for the other part of the houses. So it's not uh, still beyond, uh, still below the 50% of 50%. Yeah. And the completely damaged, like this house, where no, no, Construction is still like uh, standing, and means like more than eighty percent of the building is already done. Now, for peak ground acceleration uh, and uh, intensity measurement, so uh, we because we doing the empirical uh, empirical uh, method for the fragility curve for this uh, this part. So we we measure the uh, we using the Merkley measure intensity to to identify the intensity. Uh, so the category of the intensities that you that we use from the USGS like from one to uh, ten, like from not fell to the extreme. Some of them need to. Uh, we need to like uh, identify the damage of the some buildings around the location to to measure the intensity of the location that uh, we assess. From that on, from the intensity, we use the relationship uh, formula of the MMI, Merkley uh, Measure Intensity, from Anbazagan et al. 2000 and yeah, from the end budget and it all, and then we try to shift right from uh, the to find the PGA from the MMI that we got. Now we we've got the MMI of Bener Maria Bener Maria earthquake from Rushdie 2016, uh, so it uh, started from uh, around like eight to uh, four um, MMI. Uh, from Bener Maria to uh, surrounding area of the Bener Maria, including the surrounding area of the uh, central of Aceh. And then this MMI PDJ earthquake is based on our uh, assessment, field assessment in 2016. It's already published in our paper in 2019. So it's uh, the highest intensity is around 7.7. .7. Like this color, and then we started from the six, six to seventy point seven. But it's still only on the uh, Pidijaya. We and uh, and the uh, surrounding surrounding area, like nearly to Biran, and also the uh, uh, Pidi Pidi Aceh Pidi. Now, so this is uh, based on the. Uh, the expert judgment. I mean the uh, the the category from uh, we we divide it into three categories instead of the four. We we consider that the extensive damage, including the the collapse one. So this one is for the Bener Maria for the timber houses that uh, like it started from the uh, so so the the highest. Uh, PGA for uh, about the around uh, 0. Uh, 13 something, and then the probabilities around like uh, the heavy. I mean, the 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 extensive damage is around 30 percent for this PGA, but for the yeah you can it's see from the for the PDJaya, so PDJaya have the a little bit high, higher uh, probability uh, probability of the heavy damage uh, for the same. Um, um, not 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 higher. Sorry. So uh, a little bit different of uh, fragility curve. 
so we need to um, further analyze as some data is a real, uh, kind of anomaly in this time because we not consider the age of the building but and also the uh, we we assume that the building have the same design so further analysis need to consider about the what the quality of the material or different uh, type uh, of different age of the process as well because yeah i found that it's uh, some anomaly that are like could be created from that So this is for the masonry, confined masonry houses for uh, Bener Maria and Pidijaya. Yeah, for these confined masonry, uh, for the heavy damage, uh, yeah, it's considered consider uh, the Pidijaya have uh, a higher in uh, PGA intensity and uh, for the probabilities of the probabilities of the uh, heavy damage is uh, 15 around 15 percent and for the for the Bernal Maria is uh, higher than uh, slightly higher than 15 percent and the uh, reinforced concrete uh, houses like uh, show that uh, like more uh, um, uh, the post the potential of uh, the potential of the uh, the heavy damage is uh, higher than uh, the the other two construction because uh, it's related to the design as well and also the num uh, the, the the number of the story of the reinforced concrete houses compared to the other type of the uh, construction. So based on the result of the empiric empirical fragility curves that the reinforced concrete structures, as I mentioned previously, had a higher possibility to get the extensive damage than time per construction and a confined masonry houses. But further analysis should be done for the variable of number of story, age of the building, and also the uh, what, what, whether they meet the design uh, standard or not. And the PGA are planned to generate from the different characteristics of the earthquake as it could be compared to this uh, preliminary result. So what's next? So we still in this stage, earthquake fragility of empirical method and still in the early stage as well for of this stage. Now, later on, we need to more detail about the statistics method that we need to uh, like uh, clarify some of our data as well and later on we need to uh, have a fragility curve from the analysis analytical method and and this and we need the help from the uh, seismologists and also the maybe the geologists and also uh, the other uh, uh, the other uh, yeah, the expert to to create this uh, this fragility purpose course, and uh, and if we already like uh, 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 meet, uh, meet the uh, confident confidence for if we really confidence for the result, maybe we can like comparing with the tsunami fragility curve. So if we have this archetype of the houses in Aceh, and then we can like uh, have a assessment to uh, what is the uh, the tsunami fragility curve, and then we can compare that uh, whether the building have like a major impact from the tsunami or or it's already like a collapse before the tsunami hit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's all my presentation for today. Yep, thank you, Dr. Yunita. Just right on time. It's very comprehensive presentation. Um, I would like to remind everyone if you guys have any question, just go ahead, type on the chat or later on, just wait at the discussion to raise your own your, your hand. Raise your hand. So, 
Then we will go to the title with tsunami force acting on building and the effect of surrounding buildings. Overview based on experimental model and field work of the 2018 Sunda Strait tsunami. Before I let him present, I would like to uh, shortly introduce uh, Dr. Benazir. Dr. Benazir, um, affiliation with the uh, Civil Engineering Shahwala University and also the TDMRC. Uh, he received his PhD from the Gajah Mada University at Yogyakarta in the year of uh, 2018. Uh, his research interest is coastal engineering, hazard and risk assessment, and tsunami mitigation. Okay, without further ado, we'll welcome uh, Dr. Benazir. 25 minutes, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Haikal, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, okay, uh, my honor to the Professor Dr. Karen Mladi as the uh, TDMRC uh, uh, Director and for the our speaker today, and also for the uh, participant and committee. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Rina is talk about the uh, earthquake on ground shaking, and now we back to uh, tsunami. So the present the presented material today is about the tsunami force acting on the building and the effect of surrounding building. Uh, this uh, uh, this, uh, this material is based on the, our experimental model and also the past survey field survey on the um, 2018 Sunda Strike tsunami. So for the uh, introduction. Uh, this one for the, the, the this publication have we have three publication manuscript here. Uh, no, this the final script here. So we can access this by the following link. We can share this for the other letter. So for the first introduction, uh, I would like to show the destruction, the destructive of tsunami in the last the tsunami, maybe for the Tohoku tsunami in uh, 2011 upstream building that uh, we stand to the tsunami attack, they also take taken a role for the uh, tsunami protection for the downstream building. So, and then for the other, another tsunami, we have the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, and there the totally damaged here, but uh, the most here is still stand, where is we stand to the tsunami. So we will discuss this later. And then, in the Palu Dongola tsunami in the last year, we have the stand building where is uh, depend the the, the the destruction of this building is depend of the direction and also the uh, project area by the interacted by tsunami force. And for the last tsunami in Indonesia, the Sunda Strike tsunami, the building was not designed to withstand to the tsunami attack. However, for the lovely small tsunami, short of wave, uh, there is a Sunda Strait tsunami, which is generated by the landslide of uh, Anak Karakatau month, and not by ground shaking like the Indian Ocean tsunami or maybe uh, Palu tsunami. The building may, so, may somehow may somehow be expected to survive, but we have before we talk more about the tsunami force. We have three motive about the uh, tsunami preparedness. Uh, the first one is detection, and the second one is reversing. But we focus on the emergency preparedness. Where is the understanding for the tsunami characteristics, such as the run up, and also the inundation and flow depth? To discuss how about the tsunami interact with the, the, the ground, with the coastal land, or maybe with the building and also surrounding. So the first one, I would like to show the how the how, how we can simulate the tsunami in the laboratory or maybe by physical work. So this is the dambrick mechanism. We can see that the middle part is the uh, wave channel or maybe a uh, wave flow, 
where is the plume is divided into two section. The left side is the upstream side, where is for the reservoir, and then for the right side is for the model, or also we state it downstream uh, part. So we can see this is divided by one gate. Uh, when the gate is released, the tsunami is generated, tsunami like wave is generated to the land for the other side. So this is the um, our last uh, physical model. This one is the wave in the wave channel or in wave flow. And then uh, we have the initial condition. This one, this one for the reservoir depth, and this one is the initial downstream depth. The initial downstream depth is to represent about the, uh, the shallow water region. And for the uh, this is the result for the uh, our physical world, but this is with different or with variant for the reservoir depth and also uh, with different initial uh, condition of downstream depth. So this one for zero and zero five meter for downstream depth. But I would like to show uh, this this one of the video about this simulation. Here we go. I want to play all this frame. This is four frame here. So I want to play simultaneously of this frame. For this one, is the more. Uh, this is the higher uh, don't see a reservoir there, where it's clear the breeder of tsunami strong bore here. You can see this is wave from, and this is the strong strong bore here. Where's is the for the downstream deck is five centimeter or zero point zero five meter. Or for the another case, uh, we have uh, for the downstream deck is uh, ten centimeter. We have a different result. So we focus on bore or maybe wave front. I want to play all the different this frame. Let's see. This one is under bore, is propagated to downstream, and this one is a uh, strong bore here. So the dampening is produce uh, the dampening mechanism is produce tsunami like wave when it is propagated in shallow water and the coastal dry bed. So uh, for the discussing uh, more discussing about this, let's see. This is the case of the. 20 and 11 Tohoku tsunami. Uh, when the tsunami approached uh, the beach, maybe in shallow water, this is the port of Kuji. Uh, we see that there is strong bore here where it's wave breaking in the shallow water region. And also in the right side of the your screen, you can see that the big water here is uh, almost uh, over top here. So this is the uh, result of our result. I hope that not to discuss much about here about this uh, and then this for the run up uh, so let's return to the tsunami force uh, the first one we can calculate the tsunami force on the building uh, can be calculated by the following hydrodynamic the first one is drag force the drag force is when uh, we have the cd as the drag coefficient which depend on tsunami height and also the building height and also the shape of the building. And also we have the A as projecting area, where is the higher projecting area is the higher tsunami force can be read on this on this building. And the second one, we have the impact force, where it only happened during the first hit, where is the CF coefficient is depend on tsunami, uh, depend on the building heads. It's also uh, classified as into a low building and also a high building. And the last one is uh, debris, debris force, where is the debris in the maybe in a, in Sunda Strait tsunami is uh, is too many about the coral reef and also we found uh, the ship and also stone. So uh, this equation is just to calculate the force in the single building, not for the row or maybe complex building. So we have we develop. Uh, an equation for the tsunami force on the low building. Let's see for the 
this one, this is the side view of the, the tsunami. Uh, the tsunami when interact with the building. Because the tsunami got the backwater here when they hit the building, uh, so the gas of water is resistant of bail of water. And then from the front view, we can see that if we focus on the uh, the middle structure or the middle model here, we can see that when the tsunami hit the building, left and the right side, both sides of here also reflected the wave to the middle uh, structure in the center part. So by the dimension analysis, we we realize that the important variable here is uh, Celerity or velocity here, the tsunami height and, and projected of building and projected area of the adjacent building, both side right and left, and also as G. G is the stand for uh, gap, where is the, the distance of one building to the next building. So we also did the uh, laboratory. This one's also with the damping mechanism. Uh, we use the more uh, Higher channel, more bigger channel. This is a, a wave plume, no wave channel, uh, with two scenario: high building model and low building model. The mean of high building model, where is the wave is not allowed to overflow the model, and also for the low building, we can see that upper, uh, the when the wave interact with the model, it also can to the overflow the model. So by this. Uh, physical work and also the dimensional analysis, we get this, uh, some purpose of formula for the force on the road building. Uh, this one is uh, for CFG is coefficient for this case, and also we have A and A action for the edges of the projected area, and also we have G for the gap. So uh, let's apply uh, those equation to the the last tsunami in Indonesia is the strike tsunami. The first one, we want to estimate how much the force acting on the, the single building on the, when the select tsunami occurred. Uh, for the week, the case for in Sukarnome Felix and Iglang, we have we conducted the survey here. You can see that this this house is uh, located is about. Uh, 15 meter from the shoreline. This one is the wall. So we have the damage part is B as the building uh, width, uh, three meter, and also from the field surface, we got the 4.1 meter for the flow depth. Yeah? So we is a tsunami height. So by applying uh, the hydrodynamic uh, equations there we get the, this uh, value of the force. This is uh, around 300 ton force for the impact force and also 182 ton force for the drag force. So let's see to another case for the larger width of the building. We have another uh, location where the tsunami totally damaged the land. This one is in the Karita Mutiara Cortex in Gading Nirwana Villa in Padetlam Regency. Let's see, this is this, this one. Let's focus for the uh, region of the Gading Nirwana Villa, where it's made by concrete Missouri here. We have the one building, Owen Villa, here is where is the B, is stand for uh, width of the building 13 meter, and also we have flow depth here 5 meter. By applying the does uh, this equation, hydronomic equation, we got the more greater force acting here. So we can conclude that the projected area plays a significant role due to tsunami force on the single building. But let's see if this complex with how about the group of the building? What the force acting is occur is different from the single force acting in the one building. Let purpose uh, apply this our purpose formula. This one, uh, we have three villa. This probe villa by the tsunami. Uh, we have G here is for the gap or maybe distance from one to the next building is four meter. 
we assume this uh, uniform uh, value and also we have B is 14, is uh, 15 meter here. We want to calculate the center one of the villa and also with the effect of this adjacent building. So by applying this uh, equation, our focus equation, uh, the five we have one question here. So I focus to the left side of the building you stand here. One. This be opening building where the opening building will is uh, represented by the windows and also this is the stand for the screen. So like in the next as well as most in the agenda during uh, uh, 2000 Capture in some where the water can flow through because the strike on the also change not higher. Mr. Uh, Sense, this is all of the my, my, my presentation about the, the, the tsunami force on the building, the effect of the building. And for the conclusion, I have the first one is the tsunami force on the building on the surrounding adjacent building. And the second one, the gap of the space between the city can affect on tsunami support using purpose. Then for the last one, how can the resources like such as by building science that every hour the rock force that enter the house and the hand of residence. Let's see the final, the last slide is the, the condition of so, uh, the Banda Ate uh, reconstruction of 2004. Let's see, this is the Eurasian. This is uh, on the in the in 30. So, he uh, can help the more. The, the hair maybe and also this very very uh, density here. So I will read for the was not for the tail of the Indian tsunami for the 2000, but for the small tsunami maybe for the four meter or maybe five meter or three meter. So then, the, thank you for the uh, this is for my talk. So I will return to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Benazir. Uh, we still have a lot of times for a very comprehensive presentation. And uh, now we will uh, see there is a, 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 some of the question is already there. I already pick it up and then put it on, on the uh, on the word files. So we just go on. Now is the discussion session for the for the session two, All right? So now we have. A uh, couple of questions for Dr. Yunita. Did anyone see the slide of this uh, Word document? Can you see it, yes. Dr. Yunita? Yes. Okay, yeah. So the question in, in Bahasa, I will try to translate it. Is there any uh, 
data for all of the the graphic that you shown in your slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, apakah ada data table untuk seluruh grafik atau kurva ya? Uh, yeah. Is there a table for the whole uh, graph uh, curve? for the whole uh, grand uh, the curves uh, for the fragility curve we try to pull up the and then the all of the building type of the building as yes, we we do have like on uh, 1051 building for the whole uh, in 118 uh, per construction for bener meriah yeah for Bener Maria, we have like 1,051 uh, the whole residual houses, which include like 218 uh, uh, timber construction and uh, 813 confined masonry and only 20 of uh, reinforced concrete. So not so many uh, using uh, in uh, in uh, Bener Maria uh, having reinforced in our assessment. For the PD Jaya, we only have 594 of the whole. I forgot, but the, the table uh, later on I will like, include uh, all of the, uh, the list of the uh, damage and uh, uh, for each uh, house's criteria construction, uh, construction time. So um, the the next question from uh, the, the, the second Diana? question is uh, what is the main factor, factor yes. that generate these uh, differences in the in the curve for yeah. the post study side? Oh, unfortunately, we still like uh, trying to find what what make it the different. So maybe about the number of the uh, the divided number and uh, then some some data that we like. Uh, uh, clearing uh, so maybe maybe later on uh, we we will have like further explanation about uh, this question uh, to be included so we still find it why we we do have the major different of the curve between uh, Bener Maria and uh, PD Jaya uh, for the third one yeah it's a sample number that you use yes uh, so i already like uh, answer for i think the, yeah, I think first, the first question yeah yeah related to the third question yes and whether the pga based on the p uh civil worker uh, table or using the prime as uh, the prime survey. so uh, i i use the pga like uh using the measurement, uh, Merkley measure uh, intensity and then uh, convert it into the PGA. So name, it's related to the question uh, for for uh, Mr. Zulfakriza and also Mr. Putusangi. Yeah. So I, I, I'll directly answer the question from uh, the second question from the uh, Mr. Zulfakriza. Yeah, is there any consideration to compare the fragility curve with a soil characteristic such as uh, PS30? Yes, of course. So uh, previously we uh, we try to uh, compare what what PGA that we got from the measure Mercalli intensity with the one that we uh, we modeling from the source of the earthquake and also the data of the PS30 of uh, using the open quick and later on we will con uh, we will try to like uh, having the uh, the model uh, I mean the mo yes we we plan before but we have uh, we haven't finished yet for uh, try to make the fragility curve using the uh, data uh, char characteristic data of the soil with uh, using the PSD capture and the topography as well uh, uh, but the comparison comparison of the intensity we already published in uh, 2019 in our paper uh, for the post disaster assessment. 
of the Vidijaya. And uh, from the 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 question from uh, Putu Sangi, uh, related to fragility curve, does the reliability index is generated also for each building type and material received? There is a uh, an interesting question. Yes, we do not know. We 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 do not uh, have a general reliability index, but we consider uh, very much about this one. Yeah, maybe it's uh, related to the question of, uh, of the first the first uh, 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 from the Herdia now. But uh, what makes it uh, very different between the first curve and the other curve? Maybe. We need to check the reliability uh, index of the each building and material usage. Thank you. Um, if, if I may add a, a little bit more uh, for the question from Zul Fahriza, uh, I remember uh, there is an earthquake in 2016 in southern yes. Taiwan. At southern Taiwan, it's Mainong earthquake. So in that earthquake, they have a, a, a hot spot, the ground shaking hot spot, a ground shaking or intensity hot because of the site response are different. Yeah. So if, the, if later on they, they check on the at the epicenter of the earthquake, there is less uh, ground uh, shaking, while at the particular location they have a huge uh, intensity of ground shaking. This is because of the site response. I think this this uh, should further consider this type of uh, uh, typical. I mean, it is different between one region and the other, so it's very tricky to find out the yeah the correct uh, model to express this one. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe many, later on. Yeah. So many uncertainty factors that we need to consider when we model uh, the earthquake, like. So yeah, some, some studies already like generate about the uncertainty factors as well. So, yeah. so, so many limitations of the model that uh, we try to generate, but at least we find, uh, we, we try to find uh, like, this is the model of the uh, fragility curve and then it's, it's still going on on the top, the top one. So not, not stopping uh, one stage. Yeah. So now uh, there is a one question at least for uh, Dr. Benazir is uh, from Dr. Eldina. Uh, do you have any suggestion or do you find any differences of the uh, destruction in either Aceh, Padeglang and Palu in terms of force and the type of failure? Okay, uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, this one, this question is about the uh, three main different in Indonesia of tsunami. May I explain it in Bahasa, uh, sir, moderator? Maybe better for me to explain it. Yeah, for sure, yes. <laughs> I'll try to wrap it up later on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, baik ini uh, Ibu Elina Fatimah, uh, beliau adalah uh, Urusan. Jadi uh, dalam uh, uh, saya ber, ber, apa, ber, ber, uh, melakukan post survey pada kejadian uh, tsunami Palu dan juga uh, tsunami Selat Sunda. Tentu saja di Aceh waktu itu juga mengalami tsunami yang cukup besar tahun 2004. Tapi sini ada perbedaan yang sangat ekstrim antara tsunami Sunda dan tsunami Palu dan juga di Aceh, terutama tsunami Selat Sunda. Tsunami Selat Sunda ini memang tidak ada tanda tsunami karena gempa, jadi tidak ada ground shaking, ground shaking di situ, tidak ada memang getaran, sehingga kerusakan yang terjadi di darat di daratan itu murni karena tsunami. Maksudnya itu tidak ada seperti Palu sendiri, sebagian daripada struktur bangunan memang uh, roboh karena gempa. Begitu juga di Aceh, walaupun tidak banyak, sehingga Ketika kita melakukan survei lapangan dua hari setelah kejadian di Banten, kami memang mendapatkan data yang cukup detail kerusakan yang murni akibat tsunami. Sehingga di situ cukup terlihat. Terus perbedaannya apa? Perbedaannya dari segi panjang gelombang. Gelombang tsunami yang terjadi di Selat Sunda yaitu yang dibangkitkan karena runtuhnya tebing daripada 
anak Krakatau itu lebih pendek daripada gelombang tsunami yang terjadi di uh, Banda Aceh karena uh, pembangkitan tsunami dengan uh, gempa bumi. Maka dari itu uh, di sini ada uh, ada hal yang berbeda satu hal yang baru bagi kita bahwasanya tsunami Selat Sunda ini inilah kesempatan kita untuk melihat uh, bagaimana kerusakan tsunami yang murni akibat tsunami. Nah, berdasarkan pengalaman di Palu, nah, untuk di Palu sendiri, kami baru di lapangan itu dua minggu setelah kejadian, karena di saat itu uh, ada beberapa hal seperti penerbangan hanya uh, melayani untuk uh, relawan dan logistik, sehingga beberapa kali reschedule, sehingga kami dua minggu di sana. Dan di saat di sana pun sangat data untuk merusakkan pun sudah sedikit. Kenapa? Karena alat berat itu sudah masuk. Memang seperti itu ketika kejadian sebuah kejadian tsunami yang pertama itu yang paling di itu adalah evakuasi selanjutnya kan aksi distribusi maka jalan-jalan itu sudah dibuka sehingga ada distribusi suatu pembangunan yang diratakan supaya mudahkan akses nah untuk di Aceh sendiri saya tidak banyak berpengalaman di situ karena saat kejadian pun saya masih SMA waktu itu mungkin dari literatur sendiri kita lihat bahwasanya di Aceh itu memang uh, gelombangnya cukup besar sehingga kerusakan itu sampai 3 km ke arah daratan. Tentu saja di sini uh, impact force maupun drag force sendiri cukup besar bekerja pada kejadian ini. Belum lagi yang daerah hilir ketika membawa puing-puing dari pada yang di daratan ataupun bot nelayan itu sendiri maupun mobil kemudian terjadi impact force atau akibat uh, damping force pada bangunan lain sehingga uh, konsepnya itu Ketika bangunan yang di dekat pantai atau di Banda Aceh itu sendiri, misalkan di daerah alam dingin ataupun di daerah Ulele itu tidak apa tidak didesain ataupun mudah ataupun rentan terhadap uh, tsunami, justru puing-puing daripada bangunan itu sendiri yang akan menjadi gaya tambahan untuk uh, bangunan lebih hilir ke dalamnya. Uh, mungkin itu sedikit uh, gambaran uh, jawaban dari Ibu Dr. Elina Fatima. So for the next question, if we have uh, put to standing, uh, uh, a the question regarding the adjacent structure can show as structure on the, the flow causing decreased total force with the increasing ratio. However, local synergism of the flow was formed to increase local pressure, increasing the demand on the structure component. So how do you start guess about the development of the effect area regarding this condition. Shall be arranged in certain uh, distance or maybe strength of building. Uh, so I, for the uh, same case, I would like to explain in Bahasa. Uh, Mr. Puto Sengi is uh, my friend in the master student, master student for in Gujamada University. Uh, so uh, uh, um, I call her Mas, Mas, Mas Angga. Mas Angga, uh, pada kejadian ini memang ada satu hal yang memang kita masih menggunakan uh, struktur bangunan itu memang tidak desain, tidak ada desain code yang penerapannya itu untuk area postal area di area pantai sehingga bangunan itu sendiri sebenarnya cuma bangunan sederhana misalkan perumahan uh, sehingga perumahan itu sendiri berdasarkan pengalaman yang kita lihat dari rehabekon di Banda Aceh. Rumah bangunan itu sulit dibangun lagi di lokasi yang tidak tahu dari mana. Nah, itu kompleks, artinya itu ada deretan rumah bangunan yang memang uh, berderet dia dan itu menghadap ataupun membelakangi uh, secara terbuka terhadap laut. Nah dari sini sendiri sebenarnya hal yang paling sederhana itu ya adanya uh, mengikuti sebuah peraturan bahwa itu harus direlokasi. Memang di sini ada opsi yang memang dipertimbangkan dalam hal ini. Tapi kalau dari segi uh, mitigasi itu akan lebih baik itu dilakukan uh, uh, perpindahan uh, pemukiman, tidak dibangun pada area misalkan 300 meter dari garis pantai. Itu salah satu solusi. Solusi kedua kalau memang dari segi finansial oke okay, itu biasanya dibangun dengan bangunan yang uh, strukturnya itu diperkuat. Tentu saja bangunannya itu harus ketika artinya beberapa lantai yang cukup tinggi. Uh, ataupun uh, 
ketika seperti kita negara Indonesia yang berkembang, fokus kita masih kecil di sana. Salah satu alternatifnya yaitu ada satu akses di mana masyarakat itu ketika tsunami terjadi bisa melakukan evakuasi secara mandiri. Di Bandar Aceh sekarang sudah ada escape building di daerah perumahan tersebut. Nah, sehingga selanjutnya mungkin akan untuk evakuasi. Suami moderator to you. Thank you. Ya, yeah, uh, we will have question later on about the other to Dr. Yunita. Ya. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Trust TV. Yes. Yeah, quite interesting questions about the capacity curve. Yeah. To develop the fragility curve, we need the capacity curve. In your research, what kind of analysis did you use to generate the capacity curve and static analysis or dynamic analysis? For uh, my, uh, for the PD Jaya and Benar, uh, yeah, at the moment we only on the uh, assessment for uh, because we using expert chat or uh, critical method so we not uh, we we rely on the capacity of building on the image and the image but later on, we want to generate the like uh, modeling the the typical building to get the the capacity of uh, our archetype building, uh, residential buildings in Aceh. Uh, it could be using the pushover analysis or uh, or the for, for the static static analysis or using the uh, incrementally dynamic analysis model like the, my student did for the uh, for the Aceh Utara yeah. North Aceh and also for the Yes, for the North, North Aceh, and we still consider about the other uh, part of the Aceh, like modeling the the earthquake, and then uh, try to find the vulnerability as uh, vulnerability uh, 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 of the Aceh type of building in Aceh. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, it's, yeah. it's very complete answer from Dr. Yunita. And uh, now, probably for the all presenter, there is uh, one question: Are there any suggestion topics or ideas for next or future research in fragility curve? <laughs> to talk about that <laughs> for the last. Uh, well, Maybe it's based in right? <laughs> uh, going to answer? Hello? Maybe, uh, Prof. Anawat, maybe for how is the future idea about this? Uh, uh, fragility curves of tsunami. What else that we can improve on okay, so the baseline? From my opinion, now we have learned a bit more about the the characteristics of the tsunami itself based on everyone's presentation. Like we we we've learned a lot from Palu and from Krokotov already, but we still, know. of course, like um, structural engineering have been doing, like doing the lotes or something like that, but um, still, in my opinion, to, to study about the impact from the, the debris is still very um, difficult, but, but important. We have tried one, even our, one of our paper, we have tried to model the fragility curves from 
by by splitting <clears throat> the building which is close to the building that was away or not so we we try that like okay in the database we know that this building is washed away so we make a radius within 10 20 30 40 100 meters around surrounded by this washed away building that building will probably got um, impact from the debris but uh, and then we split the data we can see the difference but I say, but again, the debris is not only the damaged building. There's uh, trees, can be mangrove, can be um, containers, can be the fishing boat. So this kind of thing, if um, for experiment, will be different, difficult. But um, if we can um, do like a more detailed simulation, three D simulations. To simulate the, the force and yeah the interaction with the building performance that will probably in, in, it increase the, our understanding of the, the building response against the tsunami damage. It's just one quick idea that I can think right now. Yeah, maybe is is there any one want to add? Uh, from me, maybe Paika. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah. I think uh, if you want to um, dig more on the, this topic, I would suggest you to combine with the, the other uh, hot issues, as I may say. Now is uh, we call it NATEH, or natural hazard induced uh, disaster, induced technological disaster. Um, so in, in that topics, I think you can also develop fragility curve for, for example, for industrial complex that have a very similar uh, types of uh, building for example uh, industrial complex that, that have uh, oil tank oil tank reserve or kind of that structures uh, but i for for that topic i believe you need uh, will need a lot of data and, and we'll need to combine not only uh, one tsunami maybe more than one tsunami maybe three or four because number of of the industrial sites in one affected uh, tsunami area, maybe not, not many. As I mentioned, uh, maybe uh, Anamad also uh, said that maybe we need a lot of uh, data for developing a good fragility uh, at least probably more than 100. So in that uh, sense, uh, you, have, you could have maybe 100 sites of industrial sites. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can get that number. That would be very interesting topic, uh, nowadays because I, I, I haven't seen uh, people are getting more interested in the NATEH topic uh, so for the natural and hazard induced technical disaster. So that was one of my uh, thought probably if I can suggest. That's all, Pahika. Thank you. There are any others want to add? Oh, we are at the time uh, for our webinar today. So I would like to conclude some of the important key uh, during our discussion today. So first, uh, field survey and simulation and data improvement is very important uh, for these uh, topics. And uh, categorize of the construction is also uh, play the major role to estimate how the building react to the force that acting by the tsunami. And, uh, and the different tsunami has its own characteristic, such as the case of the uh, Sumatra earthquake and tsunami 2004, uh, the, the uh, Krakatoa collapse 2018, and the, the Palu earthquake and tsunami. Uh, all of those tsunami have their own characteristics. And uh, there is a, a different uh, measure needed for building that already happened a shaking, experience the shaking from the earthquake. Or the other case is only receiving the tsunami without the shaking. The, the, so we need to make those different types. And then uh, uh, the forces that acting on the tsunami, such as the hydrostatics, 
hydrodynamics, the impulsive force, the breeze. Although all of those forces uh, need to be simulated and then uh, cross-checked between the observation. Uh, so it makes us more detailed uh, measurement of the, of the uh, hazard that uh, can be resulted by the tsunami. And um, uh, the construction types, such as wooden uh, or timber, and also the masonry types of buildings, as well as its uh, response sites, are, all of them are uh, 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 taking an impact for the building, um, uh, either based, uh, caused by the earthquake itself or a different types of tsunami that already been discussed. And uh, the latest one, I seen a very good example of the laboratory works by Dr. Benazir. Um, the one that showed a video of the, of the wave being pro propagated with different kind of slopes and try to understand how this wave front been going on uh, through the inundation. And, and uh, I think that is a, a very important that the, one of the key uh, points that we learn from the discussion that we have today. Uh, yeah, so uh, for before I close, I would like to send uh, the greatest gratitude for all the presenter, uh, especially for the uh, Professor Anawat Supasri, who, who already been with us for the, for the first and the second uh, seminar, and for all other presenter, and our uh, guests and participants who are kindly make this uh, webinar and discussion very lively. I very enjoy to read and know a lot of questions. And I'm pretty sure that presenter also uh, seeing how the discussion been going. I think this topic is very important and then uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very good input for the VCP program as well. Um, so uh, on behalf of the organizer, the TDMRC would like to send our greatest gratitude for everyone, for the presenter and the participant. I, on behalf of the TDMRC also, if we have uh, difficulties in running this webinar, as well as um, internet problem and some of the communication is not going very well, I would like to apologize uh, based on that. Um, but, uh, oh, we have one last question. Do we need to read that one or we can skip it to... <laughs> I, think, I think we can... I what is that? Oh, well, maybe he, he or he can send email to one of us. Please. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if, if you have any other uh, question, please uh, do email the presenter. They are really open to have a discussion and and uh, further discussion about uh, other topics as well. Uh, so it's time for our webinar today and uh, thank you very much all thank you very much presenter uh, that's up for me wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh bye bye everyone thank you very much take care, take care during this uh, pandemic thank you take care, thank everyone. you you too bye 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 bye, bye, -bye.